Two Cities Church, we serve and worship a generous God. God is a giver, and God is a forgiver. How do we know God is generous? Well, just look at creation. Here's the main philosophical question people ask. It's a foundational philosophical question. Here it is for your Sunday morning. Why is there something instead of nothing? And the answer is very simple biblically, because God's generous. That's why. Why is there something instead of nothing? Because God, out of the overflow and abundance of who he is, decided to share himself and his stuff with us. But there's even a more clear place where we see the generosity of God. And if you're a Christian, you know where I'm going. I'm going right to the cross of Jesus Christ where we get the self-giving, self-sacrificing God. No one is a more generous person than Jesus Christ. God who gave his one and only son, how will he not also with us freely give us all things? So now this is what happens though. When you experience the grace of God, you become generous just like Nate and Elise in that video. Here's what I want you to know. Our church has been built from day one on normal, average, everyday people who put the church first in their finances. Okay, this church is not funded by a bunch of sugar daddies, okay? This church is funded instead by saints who are disciplined in their generosity, guys. And when you give, you make everything happen. Every, how do you, you don't get in a building, by the way, like this in less than eight years unless you have a generous church, and so here's what happens. When you guys give, it helps us for everything that we've done, all that we're doing, and all that we will do. Like the things that we just did, uh, for example, the prayer night, look at these pictures. Incredible prayer night. It was meaningful, and it was powerful, and it was made possible through your generosity. So thank you. But not just everything that we're doing, everything that we're going to do, right? So here's the thing. Leaders set the vision, the congregation sets the pace at which that vision is accomplished. And guys, we're headed as quickly as possible to Lexington, North Carolina. Are you excited? Yes. All right, it's going to be, guys, I'm excited. Listen, one of the leaders from Lexington emailed me this week, said, thank you, there are community groups reaching out saying that they're going to come down to Lexington and do prayer walks. I'm like, wow, that's so awesome. Guys, we are launching in Lexington. We're gonna have a Lexington community, community group gathering this September, so we're building a launch team. Here at Two Cities Church, we do not announce things, we launch them. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. We need, and I want everybody, whether you're a part of it or not, I want everybody praying about this. We have to, I've done this before with planning this church, you have to get the, you have to get the launch team out of orbit, okay? You know, when, when a rocket leaves the atmosphere, it takes a swimming pool of gasoline to get it out of the atmosphere. Once it's in orbit, it runs on the same thing your Suburban does. The hard thing is getting something out of orbit. Guys, we're building a launch team of people who love our church but love the city of Lexington. If you live closer to Lexington and you want to be a part of it, I want you to come to our Lexington uh, interest meeting a week from today after this service next week, after the 11 o'clock service. And guys, we know that we've already got 50 some people down there ready. We wanna see what God's gonna do. We are so expectant. So I'm gonna just pray for this and then we've got a lot to cover today in 2 Corinthians chapter eight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the generosity of our church. Thank you for a powerful prayer night. Thank you for all, we are just so excited about the mission and message and ministry of Jesus going forward. And we're excited about people who are gonna in many ways say a gospel goodbye. And really, it's, it's less move for the sake of mission. It's more be the church in their community. Lord, we believe theologically, foundationally, that the church is most effective when the church is most local. And so we want to be the church in Lexington, where, they, where people down there are living, learning, working, and playing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, as soon as I walk through a book of the Bible, 2 Corinthians, I never know what's going to come up. And every week is different, and normally I read it, and I go, okay, guys, you can turn it, by the way, 2 Corinthians 8. I'll meet you there in a few minutes. Uh, sometimes I'm like, oh man, I didn't even know. Look at this theme that arises, right? Uh, well, <laughs> each week the theme or thesis or thrust of the passage is a little bit different. But this week, Paul is talking about, do you know what the theme is? Get excited. Paul's talking about money. Woo! You're not as excited as I thought you might be. Uh, yeah, thank you. I want to thank both of you for being excited. Um, you know, it's real interesting, guys. I actually, I did this last service, obviously. And I felt a stiff headwind the whole time. I'm dead serious. Strange. 
It was not even, I mean, I've preached some difficult topics before, and I know what it's like. It's, you guys maybe think this is a monologue. This is not a monologue. I mean, I, I feel things in here, and it was, so we'll see what happens this service. I felt a stiff headwind, and I think it's because money is an idol in people's lives, right? I mean, men, grab your wallets right now. Ladies, grab your purses. We're going to be talking about money for 45 minutes. And here's the thing about money. Money is not in the Bible so much an idol as much as it reveals our idols. That's what money does. Why is money so powerful, right? You're like, it's a piece of paper. It's a promise. That's what money is. It makes a lot of promises to us. And so what money does is it amplifies and it magnifies your personality. Like my dad's friend. My dad had a friend. He's got lots of friends. But he had this friend, and the guy was like to golf, but the guy didn't have much money. So when you don't have a lot of money and you like to golf, you play public courses. It's a long story, but let's just say my dad's friend came into a lot of money. All of a sudden, he did not work as much. And he joined three country clubs. Look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a member of three country clubs. If you are a member of three country clubs, I want to talk to you after the service, okay? Just, I, just, I just want to... <laughs> I don't even know if it was an idol for him, but what it was, was it was his personality was magnified and amplified. Today, Paul's going to talk about money and the gospel. See, what's interesting is whenever we come here, we love to talk about the gospel. Just talk about Jesus, Kyle. Just tell us about what he did on the cross, and just tell us about the forgiveness of sins, and we love to talk about the gospel, and we don't like to talk about money. In chapter 8, Paul puts money and the gospel right next to each other. Let me just give you the big idea, okay? And if you got to leave early, that's fine. Here's the big idea for the, you don't even need to write it down. It's so simple. The grace of God makes us generous. Period. That's it. That's it. When you, when you experience grace, I'm not talking about intellectually assenting to facts. I'm talking about emotionally embracing what Jesus has done for you. It makes you a generous person. So we're going to talk about unique Christian generosity. If you're here, you're not a Christian, uh, this sermon's not for you. This is a sermon for Christians. Here, I'll show you. Let's go to verse one. Verse one, we want you to know. Paul's like, I like to talk about generosity. I like to talk about money. I want you to know. Okay, look. I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God. Before Paul talks about money, he talks about grace. That has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So Paul, okay, here's what, follow this for a second. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. You know that, we've been in this letter. Paul's writing to the Corinthians to hopefully get them to give to the church at Jerusalem, follow this, but to motivate them, he's gonna talk about the church at Macedonia. The church of Macedonia is the most generous church in your New Testament. Four different places, Paul points to the Macedonian church and says, be like them in generosity. Now, here's what I want you to know. He talks about the grace of God and the grace of God is gonna make them generous. That's why the big idea in the sermon is the grace of God makes you a generous person. Why? Because God's grace in Ephesians 2, 7, is called the riches of his grace. When you realize God has given me so much, actually everything that I have, I have and I don't deserve. Like where would you, I know a lot of, the self-made man, the self-made woman. You wouldn't be a self-made man if you were living in the 7th century in Tibet. You go, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, sometimes my geography is part of my destiny. That's right. So it's humbling. Like I, I was meeting with this guy for lunch and I did not meet with him to talk to him about money. He brought it up. He had become a Christian in our church, and he had become, uh, he gave his life to Christ, got baptized in our church, and he brings it up to me. He says, man, this is so incredible, and I became a Christian, and I was so excited to tithe, and I just got a raise, and I'm increasing my tithe. I thought, where am I? Normal, people don't normally talk like this. Here, here's what I want you to know. Giving is not normal or natural. It's supernatural. And I know what you're thinking. No, Kyle, I got my friend Bob, and Bob's an agnostic, and he gives every year to this fund. It's like, listen, Bob is haunted by a Christian Judeo worldview. That's what happened. It's not natural to give. Here's what's natural. Get all you can, can all you get, sit on the can. That's what's natural, some version of that. What's natural is survival of the fittest, guys. Come on, let's be honest. What's natural is what your three-year-old does. You don't have to teach your three-year-old not to share. You have to spend a lot of time teaching your three-year-old what it's like to be generous and what it's like to share. I just want you to see, Paul loves to talk about generous churches. Paul loves to celebrate generous churches. So he talks about the church in Macedonia. I want to just celebrate for a minute our church. I said it earlier. You don't get to do what we've gotten to do without an enormous amount of 
normal, everyday people being very generous and putting the church first in their finances. Okay, so here's, this is, this is real time. Are you ready for some real time stats? As of like right now, <laughs> if you look around in America, what percentage of the average church gives regularly? Not gives to hold the rope that doesn't give for another year. What, what part of the church gives regularly and consistently? Well, you go, let's just go to the average 100 person church. We go to the average 100, that is the average size of a church. We go to the average 100 person church. How many people of those 100 people are giving? Answer 25. 25% of the church gives on average in America today, anyone giving consistently or regularly. In our church, 70%. Praise the Lord, yes, yes. And I'm excited, guys, because the other 30% of you are gonna start giving today. We're gonna be at 100%, it's gonna be so awesome. See, what we need is we need, we need examples of giving, don't we? That's why parent, parenting's important. We need examples of giving. So I, I learned this, actually, when we did our forward initiative. When we did our forward initiative, which is the, if you weren't here, it's the generosity of our people through an initiative that got us in this building. Anyway. Well, right before, we, we had this goal of two and a half million dollars, and, and we ended up raising four million, but we had this goal of two and a half million dollars, and I remember I got up there, and like the week leading up to it, some people had gotten word of that we were going to be doing this initiative, and we had, this is a true story, we had a single mom reach out to us and say, uh, you know, hey, I don't make a lot, and it's really tough, and I've only got part-time work and all that kind of stuff, and she says, but I really want to give to this, I believe in it, I want to give $250. I thought, wow. At the same time, I ended up meeting this other couple who just moved to our church. And I didn't know who they were, I promise. And we went out to lunch and they said, hey, uh, we're passionate about buildings. And I thought, I'm building a building, so this is good. Tell me about it. They said, well, we're, we're really passionate about it. We believe in buildings. We've seen them impact people's lives. So if it's okay with you, we'd like to give a kind of a first fruits offering of $250,000 to the church. I just cried as soon as they did it because that, that was our entire budget the first year of our church. They just gave it to us. So anyway, I get up here. Actually, it was the other building. I get up here. I go, guys, crazy story. This, this single mom gave 250 and this couple, that, I mean, they just gave a quarter million dollars. And, and then at the end of the initiative, we had a, a, lots of amazing gifts, but we had some very, very large gifts come in. And I called a few of the people who gave large gifts and I said, hey, what, why did you give six-figure gifts to this initiative? I got the same answer a couple times, and I saw how God uses different people in different giving. They all said some version of, well, when we heard about the $250 gift from the single mom, we were really challenged to give sacrificially. But when we heard about the family that gave $250,000, we thought we could do a lot too. That's how the church works. Verse 2 shows us the conditions of the giving of the Macedonian church. Look at verse 2, ready? Verse 2. For in a severe test of affliction, so the church is suffering, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So Paul tells us the conditions or the environment under which they gave, and it's really amazing because the first thing we're told is they were afflicted, which means they're suffering. Now, what happens when you suffer? Uh, and this is normal and natural. When you suffer, you pull resources. Your kid's sick, you're like, All right, hold on. Who knows where this? You lose your job, you go down to one income, hold on, pool resources, because the future becomes unknown. It says they were suffering, and then they, extreme poverty, guys, we, we don't even, this doesn't, have, for the most part, even exist in America. To see extreme poverty, abject poverty, you have to get on a plane, you have to fly somewhere else. Abject poverty is defined as poverty that gets in the way of your health. Like your health is at stake because you're that poor, okay? So we're told that these, I mean, this is not relative poverty, okay? Some of you go, relative poverty, I have the smallest house on my street. That's not poverty, okay? Abject poverty is I don't know where my next meal's coming from, and I don't have any options for future mobility. That's like the definition of abject poverty. Okay, so look at this. They're experiencing abject poverty, and they're experiencing, uh, or extreme poverty, and they're experiencing affliction. But I want to show you the equation. Look at this equation. I, I'm not very good at math, but I put this up here for you. Here's the Macedonian church. Affliction plus poverty plus grace equals joyful generosity. Grace is the X factor, the secret sauce. But then, let me show you the equation in most American churches. Here it is. Ease plus abundance minus grace equals nominal or no giving. 
You can take that down. Here's, here, okay. So you, you read verse 2. I mean, there's certain verses that I read that I'm like, I don't know how else to interpret this. So you ready for this? Because I'm about to say something, you know, put your helmet on. I'm about to say something strong to some of you. But it comes out of this verse. I don't know how else to, to read this verse, okay? So you read about a church that is in severe poverty and affliction and generous. Okay, here, here it is. Ready? There is never an excuse for a Christian to not be giving. Period. That's, that's the end of it. There's never an excuse for a Christian to not be giving. And I've heard them all. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've heard them all. Let me give you the, you ready for them? Especially if you're young. Here's, here it is. I'll start giving when? When I pay off my student debt. When I get married. When I get the better job. When we're, oh, here's a big one. When we're stable. I mean, I'm not that old, okay? But I'm headed toward 40. And let me just tell you, life only always gets more expensive. Your kids get more expensive. So here's the principle. You have to learn to give when you have little. I started giving when I was making $5.15 an hour working at McDonald's, saying, would you like fries with that? That's what, and I just was taught, thank God, I was taught when you make a dollar, you give a dime. I thought, that makes sense. I was taught when you make $10, you give a dollar. Okay. When you make 100 bucks, you give 10. When you make 1,000, you give 100. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. You're not going to give thousands from tens of thousands or tens of thousands from hundreds of thousands if you didn't learn how to give dollars from tens and dimes from dollars. You have to, you have to learn to give when you have little. Now, here's another thing. This is like a little dirty little secret about giving. Here it is. There's never a good time to give, right? Wanting, wanting to know, is there a good time to give is like asking, when's a good time to have a kid? Never. <laughs> that is the answer. That is the legit answer. When is the best time to have a kid? Never. I got a friend right now. This is a true story. He is trying to figure out how to have a kid and it not interfere with his golf season. I promise you. He's like, well, there's this three-month window, and if we, I'm like, oh, my goodness. There's never a good time to have a kid. There's never a good time to start giving. But I want you to see what happens in verse 3. We're told how they gave. So first, we're told the environment in which they gave. Second, we're told how they gave. For they gave according to their means, or you could read ability, as I can testify, and beyond their means, or you could say ability, of their own accord. So, okay. It, it says they gave of their ability and they gave beyond their ability. <clears throat> so it really, and there's one that's not mentioned, but I'll mention it. They gave below their ability. They didn't do that, but people do that. So you got three options when it comes to giving, okay? I told you this is kind of just a direct sermon today, so, but here it is. Um, so the first is under your ability. So how do you know if you're giving? I can't play JV Holy Spirit. How do you know if you're giving under your ability? Or well, reminds me of a story. Guy told me, he was wondering if he was an alcoholic. He was wondering, do I got the gene? Do I like to drink too much? Is it, you know? And he said he was kind of embarrassed about it. He didn't know who to ask. He's at this event, and this expert spoke in alcoholism. And he said to himself afterwards, this is my chance. I'm going to sneak up. No one's going to see me afterwards. I'm just going to ask him. So he gets to this guy who's an uh, expert with alcoholism, and he says to him, hey, you know, ask him for a friend kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? And said, hey, how do you know if you're an alcoholic? And you know what the guy said who had 30 years of experience with alcoholics? You know. How do you know if you're an alcoholic? You know. How do you know if you give under your ability? You know. But then there's giving to your ability, right? Which, I mean, maybe, you know, we think of a great place to think about that is the tithe. We teach the tithe because the Old Testament teaches the tithe and everything in the New Testament is expanded and enhanced so we don't think there's less. We think of the tithe as the basement, not the ceiling, as the starting line, not the finish line. Here's the truth about tithing. Here's another thing just to know about people. Everybody tithes. Did you know that? Everybody tithes. Some people tithe to their country club. It's a tithe. Some people tithe to their kids' club sports. Some people tithe to their vacation fund. Everybody tithes. Paul says, it, you know, giving to your ability. But then, beyond ability, now, let me just pause for a second. Just be honest, okay? 
And maybe the other pastors would disagree, but I just, this is how I feel about this as I was preparing today. I don't feel comfortable asking anyone to give beyond their ability. I feel like, I mean, I'm just gonna give you God's word and call you to give to your ability. I think when you give beyond your ability, God's doing something unique in your heart. We've seen this. We've seen, there's been families in our church who say, God's put on my heart that the largest check I write every month be to the kingdom of God, larger than our mortgage. Oh. We've had, well, at least one example of a family that sold their house and tithed off of what they made on their house. I'm guessing most of us have not done that. The Bible doesn't say you need to do that. Extravagant. I went to seminary with this wealthy guy. He, was, he owned an AC company, and he was like second career. He was trying to go to uh, be a pastor. He was probably in his like late 40s, early 50s, second career. Really got a nice guy. Took me to dinner one night when we were in seminary together. And he told me how God was working on his heart through generosity. And he said he had this big SUV, and uh, it was a couple years old, and he wanted to get the, a new version of the big SUV. And God put it on his heart to give his old SUV to a, to a friend in the, in the church who didn't have a very nice car. And he thought, this is great because my car is like four years old. I'm going to give him this car and I'm going to get this new one. And Anyway, so he buys a new car and he's telling me this story. And his wife drives the one car, he drives the other car. They drive over to give the old car to their friend who didn't really have a good car at all. And they pull in the driveway and he said, God put on my heart, give your friend the new one. <laughs> Could you imagine so he gets out, and his friend's like, whoa, dude, this is amazing. I get your old car. He goes, no, you get my new car. I'm keeping the old one. It's about as extravagant as I can think of for a normal American to do something like that. Paul says you give under your means, you give according to your means, or you give above your means. Look at verse 4. Here's what he says. Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. They were eager and excited and enthusiastic to give. One of my favorite stories about someone in our church who was so enthusiastic to give is this guy. He comes to our church and he's loving it in mid service. I think I'll how the story goes. Mid service, he gets on his phone and he goes, I got to give to Two City Church. So he gets on in the middle of the service and he gives to Two City Church in California. Okay, he gave to a different Two City Church. <laughs> True story, they called us. They're like, I think this is, we'll contact them, but I think he meant to give this to your church. Um, that's the only time that's happened, but um, there's a genuine desire to give. Right now, most people are trying to find out excuses to give, not excited and asking for, hey, where's the next strategic opportunity for me to invest in? Most people have excuses as to why they, here's a couple common excuses why people don't give. You ready for him? Okay, here's the first one. I don't think it's going to make a difference. Okay, there's a couple things we could say to that. Number one, the story of the widow's might tells you that that's not correct. Remember the story of the widow's might, where the widow she she drops in the uh, two two mites, and, and Jesus says that was, or drops in a mite, and, and Jesus says she gave more than everybody because she gave out of her poverty. Do you know how much a mite is worth in today's money? Three eighths of a penny. So, you know, if you say, I don't think it's going to make a difference, first of all, it's always vertical first. It makes a difference to God. Secondly, actually, if you give to our church, we have a one fund, which means every time you give a dollar, it goes to everything that we do in the church. Second reason that people don't give, they have, they said, I can't because of financial constraints, right? Here's just a principle. If you keep up with the Joneses, you can never be generous, you have to, whatever you make, think about it right now. Think about what you make. I know you know what you make, okay? Think about what you make. Think about your total family income. Okay, then think this. I cannot live at the same level as people who make as much money than me. I don't. Because we've all seen this, right? Don't raise your hand if you bought a house that you shouldn't have because you really can't afford it. Now you're stressed about it. I had a guy one time tell me, I won't name the neighborhood, but it's a nice neighborhood. He said he was, his friend was in a neighborhood and his friend's refrigerator broke. And his friend was trying to figure out a financial payment plan to get a new refrigerator. And he's like, maybe you shouldn't be living in this neighborhood if you can't afford the refrigerator. People live way, among their, uh, way above their means. Young people expect to live like their parents immediately. People buy cars they shouldn't be buying. 
People go on vacations they can't afford. People live in neighborhoods they can't afford. And, th and then they make all of these decisions so that they both have to work forever. And Paul says we should be generous. Here's another reason people don't give. They're not aware of needs. Supposedly, from what I read this week, the number one reason people don't give is they don't realize there's a need or an opportunity. So here, here it goes. Here, I'm doing it real quick. I want to let you know there's an enormous need and an enormous uh, opportunity to give to Two Cities Church. One of my mentors told me, he said, at all, if you're going to be the lead pastor of a church, at all times, you need a $10 million idea in your back pocket for someone to give to. Well, I want to tell you, I have two. So if you've been considering giving $10 million to our church, I want to talk to you after this service. <laughs> but I, I'm dead serious. I have two. I'm not going to go into them right now, okay? But I'm just saying, guys, there, every church that's growing like us has more vision than provision, more money than, mo more momentum than money. Let's continue on. We've got to keep going. I want you to see verse 5. In this, oh, look, why did, why did they beg? Why did they give so generously? Why did they give beyond their means? Look here. And this, not as we expected, here it is, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. There's, this, this passage has so much in it. I don't have time to unpack it all. Here's, here's what it is. They saw giving as worship. Do you see that? A lot of the times we think worship is what we do with our works and worship is what we do with our words. And let me just tell you, and worship is what you do with your wallet. And here's the principle of giving. You have to give yourself first to the Lord and then you're able to give your stuff to others. The main fight, guys, in generosity is giving your soul and yourself and your sin to God. That's it. Once you, okay, so let me just say something else just kind of direct right now, okay? Please do not lie to me or anybody else and tell us that you are trusting God with your salvation if you've not trusted God with your salary. You're obviously lying. You can't say, God, I trust you to deliver me from hell and to bring me safely home to my eternal heaven. But I don't know if I can give you a percentage of my income. It's like you're playing games. Don't play games. We don't play, Christianity is a horrible hobby. Don't play games. And so what they did is they saw, and this is why sacrifice is connected to all this, but here's the principle, and I've taught this before, and this is not prosperity gospel, and this is not name it, claim it. This is not gab it, grab it. This is... If you want the blessing of God on your life, you have to put him first in your life. It's the principle of blessing. If you want God to bless your marriage, you put him first. If you want God to bless your parenting, you put him first. If you want God to bless your money, you put him first. If you want God to bless your health, you put him first. Now, blessing doesn't mean you're going to get more. It means that you'll have the favor and fellowship of God on your life. But look, Paul starts talking, verse 6, about Titus. Look at this, verse 6. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you, here it is, this act of grace. So Paul talks about giving as a grace. But as you excel in everything, that means to excel to me means to become exceptionally good. Here's a question. How good do you want to get at giving? That's what Paul's asking. In faith and speech and knowledge and all earnestness and in our love for you. Here it is. He repeats himself. Paul does this when he's trying to emphasize something. See that you, here it is again, excel in this act of grace also. Here's what I want you to know. So, the Corinthian church was obsessed with gifts. They didn't understand grace. How do we know they were obsessed with gifts? Because the longest passages on the spiritual gifts in the New Testament are in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, okay? So this church was obsessed with the gifts of the Spirit, but they didn't understand the grace of the Spirit. Let me translate it. They really liked to serve. They didn't necessarily like to give. And there are people who think, okay, you know, I don't need to give. I don't need to give financially. I serve twice a month. I give my time. And God says, that's amazing. But for a church to be faithful and flourish and fruitful, it needs people who understand the gifts of the Spirit and the graces of the Spirit. So Paul's going to motivate. Look here. Verse 8. I say this not as a command. Here it is. Now we're getting to the heart of the issue. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genu gen genuine. Okay, so here's what Paul does. He does this often. He does this when he writes uh, Philemon. He says, guys, I could pull the apostle card, right? Most married men, their wife has a wife card. You know what the wife card is. It's like 
and you're not going on that golf trip. Okay, got it. Thank you. That was clear. Um, Paul could pull out the apostle card. He could pull out the apostle card and go, guys, I've, you know, I write scripture. I'm an apostle. I've seen the Lord Jesus. It's time to give. Paul's like, I don't want to pull the apostle card. I don't want to motivate by law. I want to motivate by love. Paul's like, I don't want to motivate by command. That's not fun. I want to motivate by gospel. So this is the uniquely, what we're going to spend a little bit of time here is the uniquely Christian elements of giving. So you've got to ask, why do people give? And there's lots of reasons. People give because they're they feel guilty. It's easy to make people feel guilty. You could say things to people like this. Do you know that your garbage disposal eats better than children in the third world country? And all you have to do is think about it. You're like, it, yeah. All you have to do is say, do you know that you, that, you know, you have your two, three, four car garage? Do you know that just one of those garage doors in the inside is what most people live in in third world countries? Oh, man, wow. You can start to feel guilty. But guilt is a short-term motivation, and it's often used in manipulative ways. This is why Mark Twain, remember the famous writer Mark Twain? He said one time he was in church, and somebody, the pastor started talking about giving, and he said, I I was so mad because it was so manipulative and it was so guilt-oriented, he said, that not only did I not give, but when the offering plate came by, I took some money out. (laughs) If you know Mark Twain, he was a salty character. People give for the tax break. You know, it's interesting. When you get in some of these circles with nonprofit leaders, they're very concerned about religious liberty, and they're very concerned about re- religious freedom. And what they're concerned about, right, rightly so, what they're concerned about on a practical level is will people still give a lot when they don't get the tax break if that were to go away? People give to be good citizens and use the word altruism. People give so that they can be responsible. People give for lots of reasons. I want to show you why Paul says we should give. It's in verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. Here's the gospel in one sentence. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Now, listen, Jesus Christ is the richest person you've ever met. And I don't know if you read the Gospels, you go, when was he rich? Well, according to the Bible, it wasn't in the Gospels. It was in his preexistent state as the second member of the Trinity in eternity past. I know it's a lot. But basically, he was rich in his, theologians say he was rich in his person, just who he was. He's rich in power, his ability to do things. Rich in possessions, I mean, heaven has got golden streets. And then it says that he became poor, right? It's not the rags to riches story, it's the riches to rags story. I mean, it's it's hard to talk about just how poor Jesus became. You can't outpour Jesus, okay? My dad grew up poor. Whenever he gets with all his friends, he likes to, they like to try to outpour one another. You ever done that? Oh, you think you were poor? We didn't even have a car, right? You ever done that? You ever been with someone? You try to outpour them? You can't outpour Jesus. Listen, Jesus was so poor that Mary and Joseph had to make a special offering for poor people of two doves when he was born. Jesus is so, here, listen to this one. Jesus is so poor, when he's asked to pay the temple tax, he says, Peter, you need to go find a fish, and there'll be a coin in his mouth. He didn't have any coins on him. Jesus is so poor, when they're saying, what should we give to Caesar? He says, does anyone have a coin? Jesus had no coin on him. Jesus was born in a borrowed manger and buried in a borrowed grave. You can't outpour Jesus. So he goes from rich to poor, okay? But I want you to see why. Verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. Why? So that you by his poverty might become rich. When you realize that Jesus Christ has made you rich through his life, death, and resurrection, when you trust and accept, when you realize what's been put in your spiritual bank account, it makes you unbelievably generous towards other people. Paul goes... The motivation for giving is the gospel. And he goes on. Look at verse 10. And in this manner, I give my judgment. This benefits you. Look at this. Who a year ago started not only to do this work. So basically, Paul goes, I came here a year ago. I told you the church needed it. And you you said you guys filled out commitment cards. You said, we're in. We're in. I'm in at this month and all that. Hey, look here. And you had the desire to do it. You had the the quiver in your liver. You, You had the feelings. He says this. So now, finish doing it as well. Keep your commitments so that 
your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. It's very simple, basically, just the background. Paul basically shows up, and a year ago, they said they were going to give, and then they ended up not giving what they said they were going to give. And does that happen with people? Oh, yeah. All the time. Here's another principle from 20 years of ministry. People think they give more than they do. Right? Everybody thinks they're generous, right? Everyone's like, oh, no one say they're not generous. I'm generous. I smile at strangers. I'm generous. I give directions. People think they're... So I saw this firsthand. When I used to raise support monthly, okay, I'd get the report at the end of every year. All right, here's what, you know, this couple said that, you know, they, they committed to 100 a month, and I'd look at it, and I'd be like, so grateful, but they gave eight months out of the year. And then you meet with them. We are just so grateful to be on your monthly support team. I'm thinking to myself, you missed four months. This is one of the reasons, by the way, we set up reoccurring giving so that it can be automated and it can, we can keep our commitments. But basically, Paul basically says, make commitments. It's very, so simple. I don't even know how to preach on this. It's so simple. It's so direct. Make commitments, follow through. It's like giving is like golf for those of us who play golf. I used to be good at golf. I'm not good at golf anymore. But almost every time my brother, who's a scratch golfer, is giving me lessons on the range, it all has to do with my follow through. It's like, you've got to follow through. Well, look what he says next. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. I'm not trying to make things hard on you and easy on others. But that as a matter of fairness, or literally equality, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs so that their abundance may supply your need that there may be fairness. This is not Robin Hood. This is not steal from the rich, give to the poor. This is not Christian communism. This is not the mandatory redistribution of wealth or some silly idea like that. This is the voluntary, I mean, at the heart of giving is it's gotta be willing and voluntary. And here's what he's basically saying. There were other people who gave when you needed it, and now you're giving at a time when they needed it. Here's the principle in scripture. We should have equal, not equal amount. We all make different amounts of money and have different commitments and all that. It's not equal amount, it's equal sacrifice. I mean, Paul gives an interesting principle from Exodus 16. Look here to the next verse. Look what he's quoting here. Verse 15, as it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. So basically Paul's like, and he's going to do a version of this next week with a different passage. He's like, let me give you a spiritual principle from the Old Testament. And you go, where did this show up? So if you know the story, in Exodus, it shows up in Exodus 16 if you want to look at it with your community group. But basically Paul's like, do you remember, here's what he's quoting from, do you remember when God let down just a little bit of manna every day and he told everybody, don't you get too much? And the people who tried to gather a lot hoard the blessing of God. It spoiled. And they just had enough afterwards. And the people who took just a little said, I'll take the little, you know, they're a humble person. I'll just take the little piece of man, and it was always enough. Okay, here's what I want you to know. And this, you, this is an issue of trust. God has a secret, special, sovereign economy that we don't always get to see. See, John Calvin, he, the famous, if you know who he is, the famous reformer, his observation on it in 2 Corinthians 8 is the number one lie Christians believe is that when they give, something is lost. That when they give, they have less. And if you remember what happens in the Exodus account, do you remember at the end of the Exodus account, in the book of Deuteronomy, after it's been 40 years in the wilderness, God goes, hey guys, did you notice that over the 40 years your sandals didn't wear out? I wonder if when he said that, someone's like, yeah, that's, I mean, sandals last like six months or a year, not 40 years. And then God goes, did you notice your shirt still fits and didn't wear out and doesn't have holes in it? Yeah, I guess 40 years wearing the same shirt in the desert, it's pretty amazing that it still works and fits. And God's like, that was me. Like, who knows how many things, there's always a thousand things that we don't see God doing in response to our generosity to others in the way that God is secretly meeting our needs. Well, with the rest of the time, I want you to just see something briefly, because I think and it's important, and I'm going to talk about it for a few minutes. Paul ends, and I think it's a great model for me to do, um, Paul ends saying, I want to tell you just for a few minutes about how we handle money 
so that you can trust us to be men of integrity. Uh, let me show you. Turn with me to verse 16. But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. So basically he's like, I'm going to send Titus to talk to you about money and get the money from you. And, and Paul's like, Titus is going to talk to you about money because he loves you, right? And this is why you know I love you because I'm talking to you about money. I mean, you can't... One of the healthiest barometers of how a person is doing spiritually has to do with their generosity. So look what he says. Verse 17, let's keep going. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he's going to you of his own accord. Here, look. With him we're sending the brother who's famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. We think this is Apollos. Here's the first principle. Paul's basically saying, guys, I want you to know how we handle money. And the first thing he says is we don't handle money alone. Last week, you're not going to believe this, last week, guy comes up to me, I'd never seen him before, visiting our church. He says, I, he said, Pastor, I did something silly. He said, you know when you're passing those offering buckets? Last week was communion. He said, I thought that was for the communion cups to throw them in the trash. He said, he said so I threw the communion cup. He says, I actually got some money I want to give to the church here. I was like, do not give that to me. I said it nicer than that. I was like, hey, come over here. You know, here's somebody you can give that to. Because, you know, I don't touch the money. We, we always have multiple godly people at once looking at the finances. Follow along. Here, verse 19. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us. Here, look at this. For the glory of the Lord himself to show our goodwill. In other words, basically what's Paul saying? I know this is God's money. I mean, all money is God's money, but we particularly feel a special stewardship for money that is given to the kingdom of God, through the local church. I mean, I wish I could take all of you to some of our staff meetings. I mean, because every once in a while, Pastor Dave will sit down with our entire staff and go, guys, all right, here's the new budget. This is God's money. The church has given generously and sacrificially. We need to spend this carefully and wisely. Paul goes, I get it, guys. This is serious. Look what he says next. Verse 20. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For Here it is. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight. In other words, he goes, I know God sees everything. I can't hide anything from him. But he says this. But also, he wants to do what's honorable in the sight of man. By the way, this is why we just, I want you to know this. Maybe you know this already. This is why we have an outside accounting agency. Because we want to we have the right systems in place. This is why we yearly have an audit. We have a financial colonoscopy of our church every year. I want you to know that because we want to be above reproach. Look how, he, look how he ends here. And with them we are sending our brother. There's another person handling the money as well. Whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of the great confidence in you. As for Titus, he's my partner and my fellow worker for your benefit. In other words, I'm talking to you about all of this for your own good. As for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of your boasting about you to these men. Okay. We just spent 45 minutes together roughly talking about money, talking about the gospel, talking about the generosity. And here, here's the truth. I mean, there's some of you who you've got your internal defense attorney, and he or she has been working hard this entire service of why you don't have to give and why you're the exception and why when, when you read 2 Corinthians 8, there's an asterisk and we go to the back of the Bible and there's a picture of you, okay? That's all we think. And I just want to talk to you for a second because honestly, I mean, as I've prayed about this and thought about this, I'm like, look, this is, th there is no, I promise you, there is no clearer explanation in the entire Bible of why to give than 2 Corinthians 8. It, there's nothing more clear. There's nothing more comprehensive. But here's the truth. There are some of you in here who you don't need an explanation, you need an experience with Jesus Christ. You need an experience of the grace of God in your life, and you'll know you had it when you become a generous person. You ever hear the story of Charlemagne? Charlemagne, that famous emperor, when they would, before they would go out to battle, you heard this before? Before they would go out to battle, they would baptize the men, and the men would leave their swords up in the air while they were being baptized. So they'd be baptized, and one thing would be sticking out of the water, their sword, because they would say, I don't want to baptize this because I know what I'm about to go do with this, and I want to be free to do whatever I want to do. 
How many Christians, if we could symbolically show the baptism, it would be they're baptized, but what's st sticking out of the water is their wallet. I want to read you one last passage. It's from Romans 15. I want you to just see this. It's, Paul's talking about the same offering from a different place. I want you to see this. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution to the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. Same thing. Look what he says here. He says this. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share, here it is, this is the key, have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in their material blessings. Here's the principle that we're going to close with. You should give materially to the extent that you have experienced things spiritually. I saw this recently. We had this gift come into our church. It was a large gift. I thought, what's that about? I called this couple and I said, what, you know, what did God do in your heart for you to give a gift that large and trust that to our church? And they said, uh, this church has changed our son's life. He came to this church, and he was a boy, and now he's a man, and I'm seeing him growing, and he's so transformed that I wanted to give back to the very ministry that's doing this in this city. I want to say, what, what have you received spiritually, you know, from Christ? I'll make it, if I could just be so bold just for a minute, if you've received from our church, if you've been helped here, if your marriage has been strengthened, if you've been equipped as a parent, if your kids have been invested in, we would ask that people would respond the same way materially, to the same extent materially that they've experienced spiritually. I've been saying this for about a year now, and I can't think of any better way to say it, so I'm gonna just close with it again. Here it is. God designed the world so that the very thing that takes the Christian the deepest takes the mission the farthest. Generosity. You, you feeling a little dry spiritually? Let me ask you to increase your giving. You're giving of your time, your talent, your treasure. Nothing will wake you up like increasing your giving. I want to invite you, we're going to do this in a minute, but I want to invite you to invite God into your finances. No matter where you are, maybe re-invite. Because here's what happens. I've been doing this long enough to know every person at some point in their life wants to invite God into their finances. You lose your job. God, I need you. I need you. You don't have enough money for your college to get kids to go to college. God, help. You thought you'd have more to retire and you don't. Lord. The problem is we often invite God into our finances way too late. I want to invite you to invite God into your finances. And I want to invite you to ask this question. What would this church be like if everyone gave like you? If everyone gave like you, it's like, oh my goodness, the budget would triple. Or would it be like we'd literally, because you give nothing, we could do nothing, and we'd have to close the doors and go home tomorrow. We're going to end a little differently. If you'll stand, I don't want to manipulate anyone, but if you'll just stand, I'm gonna, and you can close your eyes. I want us to, to end just being open-hearted and open-handed before the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 6, just pray with me about this. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 7, Paul twice says to the church, open your heart. Paul says, I didn't wrong you. Paul says, open your heart. Paul says, love people deeply. Give people second chances. Be reconciled. Be an open-hearted church. But then in chapters 8 and 9, Paul says, would you be an open-handed church? So wherever you are, just symbolically, just if you put your palms up and say, Lord, I want to be open-handed. I want to believe in your secret, special, sovereign economy. Lord, I want to believe that when I give, I don't lose. I want to believe that everything is a gift of grace. And Lord, I want grace to make me a gracious person. I want the legacy of my family, among other things, to be generosity. I want to be part of what you're doing in the world. I want to connect my heart and my finances to your global purposes in the world. Lord, would you build here at Two Cities and across our city, across our nation, churches that are open-handed and open-hearted. We pray this for your glory and our good.